Okay, so we have an amazing guest speaker. He's from Indiana, and I look up to him a lot because he's a lot taller than me, too. And uh, yeah, we're just in a, re- this is just a special treat for us. Um, I don't want to share too much, but we had dinner right before this at the Cliffs, and there was just some amazing things the Lord was showing him for other people. And um, anyways, I just, I don't want to give away any details or whatever, but let's just give it up for Chris Reed. And um, yeah. Yeah, I look up to you a lot. <laughs> yeah, you just have fun. Thank you it. so much. Well, greetings, everybody. It's good to see you tonight. Can you get past my Midwestern vernacular? It's just a delight to be here with you all tonight. And uh, wow, it just feels good in here. What a full house. Is it like this every Wednesday? That is awesome. That is awesome. It's exciting. It's um, just a pleasure to uh, be with my friends, Roger and Roxanne, and to spend time with precious people of God, and then to meet the pastoral staff. I am just um, glad to be here tonight, and I'm expecting God to do wonders among us. I really am. I feel like that uh, something special is going to happen, and... um, My name is Chris Reed. I pastor in Peru, Indiana, not the nation of Peru, but the state of Indiana. There's a town uh, called Peru, Indiana. So I've been a senior pastor there nearly uh, 10 years. And so that's what I do full time. But I also get out and evangelize and minister. And so that's what I'm going to endeavor to do here tonight. So I'm going to uh, just go ahead and and get into... um, The scripture. If you have your Bibles and just want to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 4, towards the very end of the Old Testament. And this passage is um, from whence Roger gets his title for his book, Not by Might, Nor by Power. And so this is just a God thing wasn't coordinated or anything, but um, I want to see God displayed here tonight. Zechariah chapter 4, and I'll start at verse 1. And the angel who talked with me came again and waked me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What do you see? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof so I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying what are these my lord Then the angel who talked with me answered and said unto me, Know you not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I want you to look particularly at verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Now, this is God continuing to speak, okay? Wouldn't you like for God to speak to your opposition? Wouldn't you like for God to speak to your mountain? This is what he said to Zerubbabel. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. So I'm just going to borrow, if I was to give this a title tonight, I'm just going to give it uh, not by my, nor by power, but by my spirit, borrowing from verse 6. If you're wanting to be familiar with the text 
the situation surrounding the text, I always believe it's important to have context to the text. I've uh, said for years, I don't think I came up with this statement, but it's nevertheless, it's true. Anytime you take a text out of context, all you're left with is a con. Uh, so it's important that whatever text that you are studying, you get the surrounding verses so that you get a proper interpretation. But so what, you, what we're dealing with here in this story is Zechariah is working with the children of Judah who had been uh, exiled into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And during this 70-year Babylonian captivity, the temple, of course, had been uh, overrun and uh, it was just destitute and desolate. And so for 70 years, the children of Israel were in a foreign land practicing um, their faith or trying to hold on to their faith amongst people who did not believe like them, think like them, who worship different gods than them, who live different lifestyles th than them. And so this went on for 70 years. Now you can understand that probably the majority of the people, because of the age expectancy back then, most of the people that left probably didn't return. Okay, you probably did not live to 70 by and large in this time period, B.C., but nevertheless, the people that were returning, perhaps there were some who left, but mostly it was their children and their grandchildren. And so this temple that Zerubbabel is commissioned to undertake the restoration and the rebuilding of is the same temple that was originally built uh, by Solomon, King David's son. Now, I just want to give you a little bit of um, context on the situation or the scenario that Zerubbabel is dealing with compared to what Solomon did. Of course, you know Solomon being David's son, built the first temple unto the Lord of the Old Testament. And historians say it would literally be one of the modern wonders of the world if it was still standing. But what's interesting is if you read the Scripture, and, and, there's, and there's places that you can go, such as... Um, the Word of God speaks of uh, Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains. So he had 150,000. We're talking about Solomon when the temple was first built, okay? The first temple, the first time it was built, he had 150,000 laborers. That's quite a few, that's quite a workforce, wouldn't you imagine? Uh, 150,000 labors, and besides that, the Bible says that he had 3,300 supervisors. Now, now think about that. Can you imagine having 3,000 plus supervisors plus 150,000 employees? That's pretty interesting. That's quite a uh, quite a workforce to build one of the ancient wonders of the world. And theologians tell us if the temple was still standing in modern dollar, it would probably be worth billions upon billions of dollars. It was overlaid with gold, and it was just quite an incredible thing to look upon. Uh, but there's something interesting that's worth pointing out because this is not Solomon's building in the text I read to you tonight in Zechariah 4. This is hundreds of years later, Okay, Zerubbabel is uh, restoring that original temple, but here is the difference. The difference is when Solomon built the temple, he had 150,000 employees, and then he had over 3,000 foremen or supervisor. The ancient historian Josephus, who in antiquity, he was the first century Jewish historian that actually sided with the Romans when Jerusalem was destroyed. He told us about Jesus and his commentary, and he knew of Jesus existing, which I think is kind of cool that uh, we actually have an extra biblical source, not that we trust that like we trust Scripture, but an actual historical document outside of the Bible that says, yes, Jesus lived, he was a miracle worker, and there was a great sect known as the Christians or the Nazarenes uh, who who began to develop in the Roman Empire. But he wrote 
uh, Josephus did and what he, he told something interesting. He said that when uh, Zerubbabel went to restore this temple that originally had, might as well say 153,000, okay, people working on it. Uh, Josephus tells us in Antiquities 15, 11.2, he says that Zerubbabel only had about 10,000 laborers. So now think about this just for a minute as we lay out this scenario. Solomon, who uh, built the first temple. Now, if I get loud, it's just the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm not screaming at you, okay? So don't, nobody, nobody get uh, thinking I'm yelling at you because that's not what I'm doing. But, but uh, nevertheless, the scripture tells us that when Solomon built the temple, you understand Solomon was not working with a bunch of returning slaves, all who had all only known captivity and slavery. That's what Zerubbabel was working with. But Solomon, when the temple was originally built, he was, he was using 150,000 workers who were being paid, okay, paid, and they weren't slaves returning back from a strange pagan land back to their, for, their home country and having to relearn life back in their homeland, relearn the word, relearn the Torah, relearn the law, learn all of this stuff. No, Solomon, when he built the temple, he had 153,000 workers. On top of that, he had a, he, not only did he have a big workforce, but they weren't sad. They weren't slaves returning. Zerubbabel, he's working with 10,000 as opposed to 153,000, okay? So we're talking less than 10% of the work effort and, and the work resources that Solomon originally built the temple. Now, now get this now, Solomon was not only the wisest man who ever lived, but he was the, one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. So when Solomon built the temple, he had 153,000 plus workers, plus he had unlimited resources. He was one of the wealthiest men in all of the world, okay? And he was working with a crew that weren't, they were free. They had been free for years. And when Solomon was king, the, the children of Israel, the kingdom was united. This is before the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel divided. You know, the, after the days of Solomon, Solomon's two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, just to give you a little history, after the life of Solomon, the kingdom divided into a northern kingdom, which consisted of 10 tribes, and a southern kingdom, which consisted of two tribes, known as Judah, from whence the term we get Jew, okay? And so before the kingdom ever, ever split, Solomon was working with a unified kingdom. There was no military threat against the kingdom of Israel at that time. There was no military power or economic power that was a threat to the kingdom of Israel under Solomon. So Solomon had unlimited financial resources. He was working with people that were free and secure with unlimited resources and 153,000 workers. Zerubbabel, he's working with a far different scenario. He's working with slaves. 10,000, less than 10% of what workforce Solomon had. He's working with less than 10%, 10,000, as opposed to 153,000 for Solomon. Zerubbabel's working with 10,000 workforce, okay, which lets me know that not only was he working with a far less number, but they were slaves. They didn't have money to rebuild the temple. Okay, he was working with disgruntled, depressed slaves who had just come out of bondage, didn't know or understand their faith because they'd been exiled from their homeland and did not have access to the word of God. So they, he was working with 10,000 slaves who, were, who had just been slaves and were now having to relearn how to be free. Can anybody hear what I'm saying tonight? So not only was he working with people that, that, that didn't know what freedom was like, Many of those people, because they were under 70, the majority of the population never had seen the temple, let alone in its glory days. Now they're looking at a broken down, dilapidated building that they are supposed to be motivated to rebuild with about 6% of the workhorse, work labor force, work horses, right? To do it with, with no money, 
They're not a united kingdom. They're only two tribes returning out of the 12. Originally, when Solomon did it, it was the 12 tribes united. They were returning slaves. They didn't have armor. They didn't have an economy. They didn't have artillery. They weren't organized. It wasn't. So, so can you imagine how Zerubbabel felt trying to organize and lead this effort? He's overwhelmed. And so when he's trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? How am I going to accomplish this? How's this ever going to happen? I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. I've got about 6% of the, of the people that Solomon had. And, and my 6% are slaves. I don't have anything to pay them with like Solomon did. They're disgruntled. They're depressed. They don't buy into my vision. They don't hear what God has told me to do. They're trying to figure out whether even they even want to be here or not. So you can imagine Zerubbabel as leading this effort, how frustrated and concerned he was. And so I think it is so awesome that the Word of God tells us in Zechariah 4, after this vision comes to Zerubbabel, and I look what the Bible says, and let me read it to you again. Zechariah 4 and 6, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, a flat plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, Grace. Let me paraphrase what this means to you. Zerubbabel, you're not going to have what Solomon had. And what you are facing seems like an insurmountable mountain. What you are facing in life right now, others have had far better to work with. Far more resources, far more quality of people, you might say, to help them. And now you're undertaking something for God that seems like an uphill battle. Does anybody relate to that? trying to become what God has called you to become, trying to become a, a, a good believer, a good Christian believer, walking in the way of the cross. Has anybody ever, just to keep your sanity, just to live a victorious life, has anybody ever felt like Zerubbabel when you were looking at a mountain? And when you're sitting here thinking, how am I ever going to do this? How am I ever going to get past this? How am I ever going to get delivered of this? How am I ever going to break these chains of addiction? How am I ever going to break these chains of uh, 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 on my life, these generational bondages that have repeated in my family, one generation after the other? How am I ever going to get free of this? Perhaps maybe you've wondered how you're going to start that business, how you're going to come out of poverty, how you're going to make a better life for your family, how you're going to live a life of integrity for Christ. And maybe you like Zerubbabel here tonight feel like others had far more potential. They had far more backing. They had far more skill. They had far more might. They had far more power. But I want to tell and encourage somebody here tonight. I want to tell you what God said to Zerubbabel. And that is this, what God is calling and commissioning you to do, he's called Zerubbabel to do the same. And you're not going to do it by your resources, by your might, by your power, by your in intellect by your willpower but it's going to be a working of the Holy Spirit of God it's going to be a God thing not a you thing it's going to be a God thing I don't know how I'm ever going to get through this. How am I ever going to get past this? I'm dealing with depression. I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with my doctor says it's terminal. I, whatever your scenario is tonight, you may be looking at that mountain figuratively like Zerubbabel did, trying to undertake what stands in front of you. But just as Zerubbabel, as God said to him, I'm going to say to you, you know what you're going to do? God's going to speak to that mountain, that seemingly impossible situation that stands in front of you. And instead of you trying to figure out how you're going to do it in your own strength and your own ability the spirit of God is going to undergird you and you're going to step up one day and realize what looks like to me as a mountain looks like a plain to almighty God and just like Zerubbabel you're only going to be able to look when God levels your mountains and turns them into a flat plain 
The only thing you're going to be able to do is do what Zerubbabel did, and that's you're just going to look at it and say, grace, grace. I didn't do this. I didn't pull those strings. I didn't have those people working behind the scenes for me. I didn't have all the PhDs after my name. I didn't have all that family support, that family structure. I didn't have a lot of things that Solomon might have had, but I do have the help of the Holy Spirit. And what somebody needs to be reassured of tonight is, is that no matter what situation, no matter what mountain you are facing, the Spirit of God has declared you are more than a conqueror through him who saved you. And when you look at these situations that you're dealing with, you're going to be just like Zerubbabel. All you're going to be able to do is you're not going to be able to pat yourself on the back. You're not going to be able to say, well, it was because I was smart enough or I had enough money or I had the ingenuity. I had the skill or the ability. No, all you're going to be able to do is look at it and say, this was the grace of God. This was the grace of God that got me delivered of this. This was the, when, when death was staring at me in the eye, all I can say now is looking at this as I'm delivered and I'm free from the bondages of sin. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, grace, grace. And you're going to be able to sing that song for the first time. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You're trying to live your life for God and you're trying to do it in your own willpower and like the Apostle Paul of old in Romans 7, he infamously made the statement, when I would to do good, evil's always present with me. Well, can anybody relate to that struggle? When I want to do right, evil's there. What I try to do good, Evil's on every wing. And I just want to speak to somebody tonight some words of faith to tell you that God is going to level that mountain. And when it happens, you're not going to be able to look like, you're not going to be able to look at your workforce and say, well, we did this because this. You're not going to be able to point to the money. Zerubbabel couldn't point to money. He couldn't point to his support structure. He couldn't point to the number of workers he had. He could, see, Solomon had the ability to do that in his own strength. But guess what? That same temple was destroyed later on. But Zerubbabel was inspired by God to rise up to face an insurmountable, impossible task. And it was going to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to look with me, if you still have your Bibles open, for just a minute. Look what he says there in verse Let's, let's do verse 7. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain and shall bring forth the headstone thereof, shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it. You're going to speak grace to the mountain. Let the weak say, I am strong. Come on. Let the sick say, I am healed. Speak to the mountain, grace, grace, and it's going to be leveled. God's going to do the leveling, not you. God's going to do the healing, the delivering, the saving. It's not going to be you and your strength. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying tonight? Does anybody believe what I'm saying tonight? Praise God. So what I like about this is he uses the analogy, if you read there in verse 2, if you have your Bible there open still, it says in Zechariah 4 and 2, he said unto me, what do you see? And he said, I've looked and behold a candlestick, all of gold and a bowl on top of it and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are on the top thereof. This is powerful because the seven lamps really represent the seven churches. Remember in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, 2, and 3, the seven lamps spoke of the seven spirits of God and the seven churches. And what I like about this is that this, the seven uh, lampstands were fueled, okay, by two pipes of anointing oil fueling these lampstands as each one of them had a candle in it representing the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. It's a picture of the church, and the light of the church is being fueled by the oil from the two pipes. 
Those two pipes represent the two foundational things that we all must come to God, and that is they that worship me, John 4, 24. God is spirit. And they that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth fuel the church's light to be the light of the world. The churches are represented in the seven golden candlesticks. And the anointing oil is what fuels the fire. Can I tell you what brings life to churches that are dead? What brings light to your dark world? No matter how dark your current circumstance is, I want you to know it is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by His Spirit. His anointing, which is a picture of the oil, the functioning of the Holy Spirit, fueled the fire. Now I want you to think about what oil does. Oil, which fueled the lamps in this vision. Oil lubricates when it's used for that purpose. Oil being a representation of God's Holy Spirit. When oil lubricates, there's little friction and wear among those parts that are lubricated by the Spirit of God. Are you tired? Are you worn and torn? Are you frustrated in life? Is there friction in your home, in your soul? Is there friction in your emotions? Is there turmoil and friction in the parts of your life? Can I tell you, you need the oil of the Holy Spirit because not only does it fuel those seven candlesticks to produce the light, but it also lubricates and eases friction and tension so everybody can work and do their part properly without being worn and torn. If you're feeling worn and torn and friction inside tonight, you need to experience the Spirit of the living God. Oil does something else. It heals. In the Scriptures, it was a medicinal treatment in biblical times. In fact, you can find this in Luke 10, 34. The Spirit of God brings healing and restoration. They, they bound up the man's wounds and applied the healing balm, the balm of Gilead, the healing oil, and it brings healing. If your heart is broken and wounded tonight, if you're carrying scars from, from a broken family, a broken childhood, maybe uh, bad things happen to you in your childhood, I want you to know that if you can get in touch with the authentic Holy Spirit the Spirit it's not by might it's not by power it's not by a therapist come on now it's not by a counselor and I'm not speaking against those things but what you need is to be touched by the living power of Almighty God hallelujah there's internal healing emotional healing spiritual healing physical healing I still believe that bodies are healed. I, with my own eyes, have seen blind eyes open, deaf ears unstopped. And if you're sick in body tonight, God can heal you and He will heal you. Oil lights when it's burned in a lamp. Can I tell you where the Spirit of God is? You do not wander groping in the darkness trying to find your way in life. The oil of the Holy Spirit fuels the light of God. The Scripture says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my pathway. So much of the time, we want God to light up the runway, and all He's doing is giving us enough light for our next step. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light into my pathway, not my runway, my pathway. Sometimes we want God to show us five years down the road. He's just trying to show you five steps down the road. Amen? Oil warms when it's used as fuel for a flame. Where the Spirit of God is, can I tell you, it will bring warmth and comfort in a cold, dark world. How many of you have come to find that this world can be cold and dark? It will use and abuse you and spit you out and not think twice about it. Oils are used, they invigorate when used to massage the Holy Spirit has a way of massaging the aches and pains of your life away when you get in the Holy Spirit. Oil adorns when it's used as a perfume. The Holy Spirit has a way of making your life more pleasant to be around. Any, has anybody ever, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, in fact, please don't, but has anybody ever been told, I just can't stand to be around you? That's the effects of sin. 
Not just on you, but those people. It's that friction. It's that discontentment, that frustration, that war within your soul. When you're, if, if you're at war with yourself, you'll be at war with everybody around you. It's true. And the Holy Spirit is like a perfume. The oil makes us more pleasant to be around. Yes, it does. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you'll find, if you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking in tongues, you can get it here tonight. It's here. And it will do all these things that I'm telling you the oil will do in your soul, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit. The Holy Spirit adorns us, makes us more pleasant to be around. Get this, here's another thing oil does. It polishes to shine metal. The Holy Spirit has a way of wiping away the grime of a dirty world and smoothing out our rough edges. So I want to say to somebody here tonight, if you've never uh, been baptized in the Holy Spirit, now I I'm not talking about, I'm not telling you you're not saved. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is an empowerment, a, a baptism of power of that oil. You need that oil to face your mountain just like Zerubbabel needed that oil to face his mountain. You can't do it on your own. Stop trying to do it on your own. You need a helper. And the Holy Spirit is our helper and our comforter. And Jesus said in John chapter 7 and verse 37, you can see in your Bible, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, this is before that he died at the cross. But out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, that they which believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified or ascended. How many of you here tonight have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. If you haven't, that's the first step. But the next step is to let a river out of your belly. That, that doesn't mean your stomach. It means your innermost being. Okay? Out of your belly. So what does that mean? I'll come back to that in just a second. We then go into the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and it says, When the day of Pentecost, or the Jewish feast of Pentecost, was fully come, they were all together in one place. There came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared in them cloven tongues like as if fire. And it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. When they received that power, they had exponential power to heal the sick, to cast out demons and devils. And so will you. If you'll go beyond believing and say, all right, now I'm ready for empowerment. And I'm going to ask you the same question that the Apostle Paul asked, asked the Ephesians believers in Acts chapter 19. They were the followers of John the Baptist. And he asked them, he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Everywhere in the book of Acts, you can find, you can see it yourself in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, when people received the Holy Spirit, there was one common evidence every time. There was one manifestation in every situation, and that is they spoke in an unknown language to the speaker. While they were praising, praying, and worshiping God, they lifted their hands. Now let me go back to that river part. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Are you all hearing me tonight? Is this okay? Out of your belly, your innermost being. So here's what it's got to do. <clears throat> I hear people say, I don't know about that speaking in tongues business. I just can't ever see myself doing that. I, I, I want control of my tongue. You know why the tongue, <laughs> right? It's amazing how we claim we want control of our tongue till we're angry. Hello? And so James tells us why in James 3, he says, the tongue is the most unruly member of the body of everything that's been tamed. The one thing that hasn't been tamed is the tongue. That's the reason why when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will speak with tongues. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants to tame the one part of you that's been untamable. 
Think about that. That's why they all spoke with tongues every time they received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So here's what it's got to do. When you lift up your hands, and we're going to do it here in just a little bit, I'm going to call every person forward that is hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you come forward, okay, all you have to do is believe on Jesus, confess him with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And when you lift your hands, all you begin to do is say words like, I praise you, Lord. I glorify you. Hallelujah. I exalt you. You don't, you don't have to be technical. You can say, I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You, you know what happens when you are sincere and you believe? You got to believe it's for you. You can't doubt that. You got to believe it. And you got to want that spirit to level and flatten your mountains like it did for Zerubbabel. You got to want that in your life. Is there anybody that wants that in your life? How many has ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues? Lift up your hands. It's all right. How many of you here tonight have never done that and you're brave enough to slip up your head and say, I haven't? That's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's awesome. Thank you for being honest. Thank you for being sincere. So here's what happens. When you are praising and worshiping God out of your belly, flows rivers of living water, it has to skip your brain. Come straight out your mouth, out of your belly, shall flow rivers. If it's if it comes up out of here and stops at your brain, you'll process it and you'll keep it English or your known language, and you will not speak in another language. You have to shut your brain down and just open your mouth. You say, Well, I'm afraid that if I speak those words, it's just going to be, you know, it's just going to be me jabbering something silly off. Well, first off, it will be a known language as the Holy Spirit gives the utterance. I want to make that point. But when you open your mouth and you start saying the words, that's where faith comes in. You have to start speaking and then he'll take over. And you can't worry how silly it sounds, how foolish it sounds. You can't worry about that. You got to be willing to look like a fool for Christ. You got to be willing to say, I am unashamed. I want what the Holy Spirit has for me. I'm not going to be happy without the fullness of it. How many wants everything that God has for you? I, 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 listen, I don't want to live without everything that God has for me. I want you, oh God, to absolutely baptize me, satisfy me. Give me that Holy Spirit that will help me to face no matter what mountain stands in front of me. It's not by my might. Just like Zerubbabel, he didn't have the might or the workforce. He didn't have the power or the resources or the money or the help. Right? It's all by the Spirit of God. And suddenly things that you have struggled with within yourself, trying to stop, trying to overcome, trying to get victory over... When the Holy Spirit comes in, what used to be a struggle will effortlessly start happening for you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Can we all do something together corporately and lift our hands to God as a sign of surrender? That's, that's what you're doing as a sign of surrender to God. Holy Spirit, work in my life. Holy Spirit, I desire your touch, your hand, your glory. I don't want to be satisfied with anything else. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, have your way in my life. Have your way in my life. Have your way in my life, Jesus. I want to call some folks up to pray here in just a minute, but I want to... uh, Jesus sat down with the woman at the well. There's several gifts of the Spirit, okay? And one of them being prophecy or the prophetic. And you all know about that. The word of knowledge is when God gives someone by revelation a piece of information about their life, never to embarrass or expose, nothing nothing like that. It's all to edify. That's the purpose of the gifts. It's to edify. And Jesus sat down in John 4 with a woman of Samaria, remember? And he was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. They didn't know each other. They were different races. He was a man. She was a woman. And so Jesus sits down. He says, give me drink. Remember this story? And she says, why do you, right? Religion always has a way of bringing the race card in. Why do you, being a Samaritan or being a Jew, ask of me a Samaritan drink? And, and so Jesus said, if you had asked of me, I'd give you living water. But, but the point that I'm making is he says, go call your husband. Come to this well and talk with me just like you are, Jesus said. And 
And she said, I have no husband. You know what Jesus said? You've said, well, you have no husband because you've had five. And the one you're with now is not your husband. You know what she said? Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Just that little bit of information. Right? What a crazy piece of information. He wasn't telling her what she's going to be doing 10 years from now on this night. He just said, yeah, you've had five husbands and you're living with a, a, another man now. And she's like, I perceive you're a prophet, right? And she goes into the whole city of Samaria and says, come see a man. Watch this. And I want to read this. Come see a man which told me all I ever did. And I believe that set the spark for the book of Acts when in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, Philip went down to Samaria. And remember, he did signs and wonders and miracles to the people and they believed and people were healed and devils were cast out. Why? By the power of Jesus. And then Paul says it like this, talking about the word of knowledge. He says, if someone comes in among you and you all speak with tongues at the same time. He's not talking about your personal prayer language. He's talking about if you all at the same time are speaking out loud in tongues and this person who knows nothing about the Bible, nothing about the Holy Spirit baptism, walks in and sees this, he's going to think, you all are crazy. But Paul said, if one gets up and reveals the secrets of the heart, not to embarrass, not, not to expose, no, 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 and I don't want anybody to think that tonight. Remember that. But if one gets up and reveals the secrets of the heart, they'll know of a surety that God is with you of a truth. Is anybody in this place tonight that will say, speak, Lord. Your servant hears. Can we every head bow, every eye close, and let's pray right now. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we come to you knowing that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And Lord, this little message here tonight I pray is going to move upon someone as your Holy Spirit is demonstrated here tonight. Show forth yourself strong. <clears throat> Show forth yourself mighty. Show forth yourself to do the impossible, what you've always done. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Have your way in this place and change hearts and lives. Do the impossible. Change our hearts, Lord. Demonstrate your power among us and let this be a night where people will leave and forever say, we've never seen it on this fashion. Let this night be forever seared in our memory to where we saw the greatness of the Holy Spirit revealed amongst your body of believers here tonight. Show forth yourself strong, mighty God. Show forth yourself strong. And do great things among us. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Let's just close our eyes just for a minute and meditate upon the Lord. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Now, I don't know anybody in here tonight. I met Roger and Roxanne for the first time in person yesterday. And uh, so I know that um, there's nobody in here that I know. I'm not connected to any of you in life in any way, shape, or form. Um, how many of you is that true? You don't know me. I don't know you. There's no way of that being the case. And God knows that to be the truth. Is there anybody in this place that would say, I would like for God to speak to me by revelation. I want to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody in this room that would say that? You know, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Right? You're kind of hesitant. Maybe, oh, I don't know. Right? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm waiting on the Holy Spirit. We don't have to get in a big hurry. I've been in this position many times. And I want him to orchestrate this. This is not some man-made thing, okay? This is a moving of the Holy Spirit. Have your way tonight, Lord. Have your way. Um, I, uh, one, two, three, four. I want to speak to the brother, the fourth person back. 
Yeah, in the white shirt. What's your first name, brother? Kim. Kim. All right. Well, we don't know each other. Is that correct, Kim? We've never met. We've never spoken. Don't be afraid. Nobody get nervous. Nobody get their stomach all up in knots, right? Um, I am... Um, I uh, I keep getting the name Samantha. Amanda, Samantha, Mandy. Is are you? Do you know a, a, a Mandy and a Samantha? They're your daughters. All right. Now, I don't know the man at all. Nobody's told me anything before God. If anybody's told me anything, I'll take it to the judgment. I'm serious. Uh, nobody has said a word to me. I've not talked with anybody ahead of time. Nobody's got an earpiece in my ear. Okay, this is not some... This We want this to be a sovereign moving of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Yes. Um, I keep getting the... My parents' anniversary is November 18th. There's something relevant regarding November 18th regarding you, Kim. Um, that's just my birthday, he says. How about, is it November 18th, 1951? Does that sound about right? That's fine. Don't look at me. Keep your, keep your mind focused on Jesus. Now, uh, something to do with, I see you walking, uh, graduating. I know this has probably been a little bit ago for you. Um, you don't look old or anything. I'm not suggesting that at all. And see, by the way, some people think the prophetic's just got to be some, oh, some serious thing, you know, that you just have to look all frustrated and consternated. No, God wants to talk to you through daily life. Um, Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Is it Missouri? Kansas City, Missouri. Huh? That's where I grew up. Oh, so you're... <laughs> not by might, not by power. Amen. I want to read you a scripture. I um, Let me bring you up this verse here. All things are possible to him that believeth. I think that you um, certainly believe. Um, assume that's your wife um, sitting next to you. I think I shook her hand when she came in, I think, but I, I mean, I'm bad with faces and I don't even remember, um, I, don't, I don't remember uh, names, but something to do with uh, you two 19, is it 80, 1980? 81, 80, okay, um, it was in the month of, um, I see May, is that right? Sure. It's <laughs> <clears throat> either like the 17th or the 19th, 19th? 17th. 17th or 19th. I knew it was one or the other. Hallelujah. I didn't even ask him if he had previous spouses or anything like Jesus did, right? All I said was is some things that God showed me, details about his life. And the woman in John chapter 4, she said, I perceive thou art a prophet. And she went into the city and said, come see man which told me all I ever did. And that was, the, that was the sign of the Messiah's first coming. And I believe this sign returning to the earth is also a sign that will accompany his second coming. Okay? 
I, the word that I want to give to you, brother, is I see revival coming to your family and a breakthrough coming in areas with grandchildren that you don't even have yet that, that uh, God is going to use in the uh, future to be incredible instruments and, and, and carry this gospel in unique places in unique ways. Who wouldn't want revival in their family? So I decree it and declare it and prophesy it tonight that revival's coming to Kim's family. Does anybody believe and accept that with me here tonight? I, uh, I want to speak something else. I, I want to um, read you a scripture, Mark, that says this. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Hmm. Um, I, uh, I want to, have your way, Holy Spirit. Um, Daniel, I want to, I'm going to, Pastor Daniel, I want to speak to you if I can. Um, there's, uh, just some things that, uh, is there, um, uh, uh, somebody named Brad? Yes, my brother's name. Okay. Um, wow. What's the name of the one, one of the men that, that, that took up the offering up here? Which, what is it? Rob. Rob. God's going to do something in you tonight, uh, Rob, in your life and in your health. And uh, he's going to break some things off of you in a new and fresh anointing coming into your life. I just, I feel that. Uh, you know, uh, is there a uh, Valerie? Valerie? Okay. Um, so that's who, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, help me, Holy Spirit. Um, you had a, was it your, it was, I think it was your dad, was it, that passed away last year? Yeah, last January, around, I don't know, somewhere 10th, 11th, 12th, I don't know, somewhere around the first part of January, some, something like that I keep getting. Did you, you lost your dad, I'm assuming? Yeah. Early part of 2018, some, somewhere, I just, I just see grief. I um, uh, feel like that there's a void that is still not completely filled in your life. Some questions that perhaps you're wondering, and I just want you to put all those things in the hand of God, all those uncertainties. Um, I get the, uh, the see, there's a, uh, oh, Help me, Holy Spirit. I see. I see a. Uh, va uh, I said, Valerie. Is there? Is there a? Um, a Kiera. Uh, who, who's the? That's okay. I keep. He I keep hearing Uncle um, Dan. Uncle Dan. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, what about, you got a, is there a sister like Jenny or Jennifer? Okay. Uh, this was the name that I, I got earlier and I, I wrote this down. N-A-F-Z-I-G-E-R. Christopher. Yeah, Chris, yeah. With a K. Christopher, 
Okay, with with a K, is that correct? It's like, um, what what do you say? Um, I uh, is that um, is it uh, is it like a core of grace? So that is by other uses. Okay. Um, there's a prophetic anointing on that Korah. It's still, it's it's certainly far from. But but you're going to see in the early stages in her life that she's probably going to be a dreamer, and perhaps maybe even as a child, uh, she may have like uh, nightmares, night terrors. Is that, that's already happening? Wow. Wow. It's already happening. I had no way uh, of knowing that, but uh, the, the, per, the, the purpose for that prophetic word is because it's just crazy. I, I just see such an anointing on this little girl. That's why grace was her middle name. It's only going to come by grace. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Grace is the working of the Holy Spirit. You don't, can't tell me that a sovereign God doesn't know what he's doing when he puts in the mind of parents to name their child a certain thing. Ah. Uh, How many is going to help me pray for core grace? <sighs> um, so I met for the first time today. Um, Be patient with me. I, I uh, help me, Holy Spirit. I keep. I'm getting a scripture that I want to pull up. I've, I've had this um, thing where if I bring up a scripture, Psalms 109, 24. My knees are weak through fasting. My flesh is feeble from the lack of fatness. I also have become a reproach to them which look at me and shake their heads. Help me, O Lord. O save me according to your mercy. That they may know that it is your hand, not by might, nor by power. That you, Lord, have done it. Verse 27. So I met today um, Ro Roger's daughter. Is she here tonight? I th I th is she? Yeah, right back there. So um, when I met her today... Um, God gave me her address. Is that not, is that not true? I got her address and that's just by revelation meeting her. I didn't, you know, um, but there was something as I, I was, I, I had a vision of you in my mind just now. And I keep getting, is it like July? Did you just have a birthday? I said you're 32, right? Yeah. Um, July 20th, 1987. That's your birthday. Um, I just see a an Esther anointing on you. I feel like that I feel like that there's been many things that you've been waiting on from God and that uh, you have chosen to not settle in life, to not settle for uh, just anything or any person. And I just feel like that you're about to come into a season that God's going to bring the right person into your life. I just sense that right now that 
the person, somebody you've been waiting for, believing for, and not accepting anything less than. I believe it and declare it that that's going to come into existence and into fruition into your life. And it's going to be a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit and you're going to be amazed and you're going to remember that on this very night, it was spoken by the mouth of a man of God. And it's not going to be by might or power, but by his spirit. Can we lift our hands all over this place? Um, have your way, Lord. Have your way, Lord. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. All things are possible. Um, if I could speak to uh, the couple that I met here tonight, is it, is it Bob? Is that right, Bob? And um, for some reason, I keep getting the name like uh, I don't know if this is relative to you, but is it like an Angie or an Emily? I, I don't. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay, so that's your, wow, sitting right next to you. And who? Em, that's your Emily? Emery, okay. And what's your first name? Angie, okay. Wow. I just uh, see, um, she, how old is she? Yeah, hey, I don't know. I, just, I saw a little girl just a minute ago, and I don't know. It's like lighter hair, and um, either way, um, wow, that's something that uh, different. Um, help me. Your birthday is July the eleventh. Um, your son Fletcher is uh, Valentine's Day his birthday and then a Dustin um And you're from Colorado, correct? Fort Collins, is that what we, yeah. I feel like that this weekend is going to be a weekend where something is going to be conceived in you that you've desired and taken interest in. And I feel like this weekend is going to be a generational prophetic impartation for you. You've longed for it, desired for it. And uh, I'm going to lay hands on you in just a minute and the fire of the Holy Spirit is going to touch you. I just, I believe that. I believe that. And um, I just feel like uh, God is going to do some in incredible things. And... Uh,